Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Cafero.tv, where we'll bring you our program and packed, where we're going to discuss and quite a few uh, ideas and information. And our guest today is one Michael Chiviru Nagenda, who is an expert in the ICT industry. Uh, you are an expert at cloud, you're an expert at big data, but today we're going to discuss cybersecurity. It's lovely to have you here today, Michael. Thank you very much, Angela. Um, from what I see, you have quite a lot under your belt when it comes to ICT. But uh, today we're actually going to look at cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. uh, now, when we talk about cybersecurity, most people are, okay, maybe it's another frame of security, but I know that they're very tickled by the word hackers. Mm -hmm. Can you demystify for us what hackers are and why are people so interested in this hacking industry? That's actually a very good question. I think to first understand what a hacker is, in a very simple manner, it's just someone who knows computer very well. Mm -hmm. It's basically his plain truths, more or less. And, but because we have seen movies and uh, seeing cars driving somehow and someone entering there like Matrix and all these things, we always believe it's kind of like, I don't know, a god or in some way. But in, in, in the real picture, really, these are computer experts at another level. Um, so you've been working in the security area for quite some time. Yes. Um, there's a time where I was working with um, a firm that recruits ICT students. Mm -hmm. But they would come in and they would say, I finished my Microsoft Office, I now want to be an ethical hacker, or I want to now become a security guru. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously you've had a lot of experience. How did you get into the security aspect of it? Because it's not something you wake up and do overnight or even one year. Yeah, actually also maybe I tried with Excel and Word and all that, but it didn't take me there, no. <laughs> it's basically the interest mm -hmm. first that catch my interest. Really, the road is not that you go into cyber because you want to go into cyber, but you just have interest to know more, to explore more, and you go into the bits and the bytes, and then you go into crypto, crypto and then you, you, you get questions in your workplace or whatever you do, like, okay, how do we not, we have now this machine there, but how do we make it secure? So you start now exploring and reading and studying and asking different types of questions. Mm -hmm. And then before you know, people tell you like, hey, you know what, this thing we do in cyber security, and like, what's that? Oh, this thing, it's cyber. So you now start slowly to look more into the direction. So my interest has always been to really understand what is this thing about and somehow I just fell into it because in an expert, you also ask more and more and more questions. Uh, between you dabbling into Microsoft Excel and uh, becoming an expert, what's the average time span oh. it would take to get into security? Because just like um, wanting to maybe put uh, uh, fixed potholes, you need to know the road network. Yes. So it's not just a matter of having the security aspect, but even having the knowledge of mm. a computer network. Mm. So how, what time frame can I say minimum? That, that's a good question, wow. Um, I mean, I did IT, my, my IT training has been in Germany. And uh, when I finished actually my full training, I could go to work, but I said, no, I want to, I want to study to get more knowledge, mm. which I did. I didn't finish because I, I didn't get my knowledge. Mm. Like then I took a bit a different route, but you see, um, even during my training, it was about three years, and those time even the whole IT was still new. Even when I went to the school, I was like one of the first batch of students on that. And you find that I just, I was hungry for more. So when the, uh, the professors or the, 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 the trainers would set up the computers, I would be there when all the other students are gone. And they would tell me, yeah, we need to put up a campus Wi-Fi network. Yeah. I have no clue about it. They would tell me they need radios. And I'm like, what's radios, mm -hmm. basically? So you really have to go to the level of 
just opening up a computer, putting the pieces together, understanding that. Then you go to operation to operation system, understanding that. Then you go to the, the user behavior, the internet. As you said, uh, I had to put up together firewalls. Yes. So what is firewall now? And so I got more questions, but the more they get answered, as I said, you go higher and higher. So years really to invest into, I wouldn't say less than five years to really know what you're talking about. Because me, I'm someone, I want, when someone asks me something, I know what I talk about. Not, or oh, let me Google it. I'm, I'm answering you just in a second. So um, I, I would say really it takes a good free, four, five years at least, at least. Yeah. Now, uh, we're also in a space where we have a lot of uh, mobile digitization. Uh, we see that our mobiles are our banks. They are probably holding our medical history. We have medical apps in there. What are the vulnerabilities? Or what can we do to stop ourselves from being vulnerable mm. to cyber attacks? Because we, we assume maybe, you know, from the movies we've watched that they're trying to target, you know, some bombing place mm. or center. Mm. But even the, the, the small gadgets that we use mm -hmm, are, mm -hmm. are very vulnerable. Very true, so very true. How, what are some of the small things that we can do to keep secure? Wow. I think, first of all, we have to understand that it's not anymore just that handy, just that calling gadget, but you're carrying a full-fledged computer with you. I mean, today when you look at the iPhone, for example, I mean, the, what it can do and the power it has, some years ago, not many, I'm not talking about 50, this whole hole basically will, will not be enough to hold a computer of that. So we have to understand that we're holding a very powerful gadget mm. with us. It has cameras, it has sensors, it has, I mean, it has a lot. So then we have to understand that also, it's, it, it's our access, as you say, to either bank transaction or our private life, etc. And it's not anymore this heavy machine that we have to work in, but it's something small we can lose so fast. So understanding basically what it really is, it's really a computer, it's not just a phone like that. And it has, to, it has an operation system. So if you go on computer and you have Windows or Linux, also the phones have an operating system. It also needs updates and being kept updated and what, what, what. So if you understand that, then you're like, you understand that you actually have to take the same measures, what you do for your computer, for your phone. Because it also has an operating system on it. And um, I think one of the things to be doing first is to really select a good phone. And some of the phones we select, they have an operating system, as I've ex explained, which you can't update. Mm. It's basically frozen there like that. And some special phone, not even special, some brands, mm. you know you can update it. And the other thing is put a good pin. Yes. Put a good pin in there. And when you're talking to someone, don't just like, oh, Put the pin there and yeah, that's it. So, and uh, or when you, I mean, when you go to the ATM, it shows you don't put the pin while everyone is looking, but at least it's the same thing. You take the same measures. Then maybe see also that, you know, the camera can be activated yes. from the bad guys or how, how you want to call them, hackers. Yeah. So also know that in your private rooms, you don't... You don't have to your, take the your, phone your every, yes, yes like that because the camera has it it has microphone sensors etc so really understanding it's a full-fledged machine mm. that has a lot of capabilities and to limit it you don't have the knowledge anyway yes. not fully but what you can do don't just dump everything on it right. because things are accessible on it accordingly okay. uh, in the recent uh, past we've had all kinds of hacks that have happened. Mm -hmm. uh, ransomware is one of them. Yes. Um, could you please explain to our viewers, because it went around, I mean, mm. we saw it in the newspapers, ransom, ransomware, ransomware. Could you kindly explain to us what actually that means and how easy it is to fall victim? Okay, okay. Yeah, ransomware now is everywhere. Just a few days ago, Russia hit another one, a big one. Um, and I think here in Uganda, we, we just don't understand yet what it actually means and, and, and what effect it brings. Mm -hmm. But uh, a few months ago, hospitals in London had to close and they couldn't treat the patients. They couldn't do operations because the machines were not working anymore. They had a ransom attack like that. And 
it has really gone bad. It's not anymore. Yeah, just a computer virus, just by co some computer went down. No, today it has really life implications like that. And some of the issues, or let me just explain what actually ransomware is, as you ask. A ransomware, I mean, it's taking something ransom means you get a software, very, not all of them are very well in, uh, implemented. And it basically comes on your computer in different ways. We can go there, but I don't know if we have that time. In different ways, it comes on your computer. And then it takes something basically captive. And once it has taken this data captive, it encrypts them. It means it puts a layer of security on top of it, which you can't break. It's like when you log into your computer, you put in a password. When you open your phone, you put in a pin. Now, these guys get a new key that you don't have, and they basically tell you, look, when you want your data back, pay for it. And it goes to the level that some companies, global companies, they can't operate, and they're losing millions every single day because the data basically was arrested. And if you want to get access to it, you pay some money for it. And without payment, no access. And they actually usually put a timer, because why I brought that story up was... Uh it actually happened to a grandmother. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> she uses a computer. somewhere in Russia, yeah. <laughs> okay. She was, yeah, her laptop and her grandbaby's pic uh, pictures were on there. And so the rant, and they told her, if you want those pictures back, yes. you need to pay $500. Exactly. And she actually ended up having to pay. Now, uh, ransomware basically is intertwined with data. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about big data? Because it's also another huge thing. Very huge. Um, I don't know if I can ask you to go deep into it. Should I elaborate some more? Or what, what is big data, number one? And yeah. uh, why is it so important for every company mm. wanting to invest in big data? Wow. It's a big topic. That's why it's called big data, right? <laughs> big data basically is really to collect as much information as possible from as much people as possible or from the, a person as much, a, 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 as much as possible to then make out of it something. So that something can be different things. For example, if we talk about farmers to bring it just on the low level and we were to, 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 to go really through all Uganda and measure the crops, how big they became, with the weather condition that has been there, etc., etc., we, we might find certain... Um, things which are somehow linked, interlinked together, which if I will have just looked, I don't know, went to my Cindy, just check there, I will have not known, but because I go on a wide range, I get a different understanding. So big data, talk about cancer, for example, or diseases, etc. cetera. Um, you can't understand certain things with a limited uh, set of data. But if you have a huge data set, you can get understandings mm. that before were not even possible mm. like that. So that's basically big data. And today in the industries, I mean, Facebook is big data. Twitter is big data. Mm. Google is big data. If you go to Google and you put in a search, before you have even finished, it completes the whole right. sentence. Why? It knows in Uganda, not just Uganda, but in Muyenga, mm. especially, there's a certain group who's searching for this keyword. So it's very likely that mm. that person who's now typing once exactly, that very word so big data i mean it's way more than mm. i'm saying but that's part of it basically so it's uh today it's basically the number one area in it is driving mm. though there are other areas which are also upcoming now when you when you decide to tie big data and mm -hmm. hackers because mm -hmm. we, we we might look at hackers as attacking an individual for example ransomware mm -hmm. But do you believe hackers will be very interested in big data and why? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, we had a hack just a few days ago, weeks, in South Africa, in, horrible enough. And just weeks before, it was in America, another horrible incident. And they basically get your medical data. They get to know how much you're earning, uh, who's earning how much. They get to know um, your age. Maybe even you have children, etc. I mean, they get data. You could think to yourself now, well, if someone got the data, yeah. I mean, it's just me. Yeah. But now it's not just you, but it's uh, maybe a whole country where it's, uh, it, it's a lot. So one thing, for example, just to say, a hacker who now gets a lot of data at once, and um, analyzes the data, gets also certain understanding. For example, what type of passwords is used most often? 
for example. And then for a hacker, like uh, one of the most valuable thing is to get as much data as possible because if I crack it, let me say there were passwords mm -hmm. and I was to crack them. Mm -hmm. Then after cracking them and there are a lot, it means then I can also estimate that the number I've cracked, some of them still work for other users maybe right. on Facebook, on Twitter, mm -hmm. etc. And so, and then not just that, but if I have a lot of data, I can sell it. Yes. And the other side is also, we, we, we might not know, but when we hack, we get certain data and that data, again, we can use to do bigger hacks. Wow. So if I hack a certain database and I get a lot of emails, for example, I sell the emails to someone who wants to do phishing. Phishing mm -hmm. means really targeting someone with the email, basically. Now I have a huge data set and means more money for me. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. Um, sure. We're about to go for a break shortly, and uh, we'll be right back. And we hope you're enjoying the show. We've understood that our generation majorly is a disconnected generation. And borrowing principles like Ujama gives us an opportunity to look back in our stories and find our PowerPoints that we could use to triumph forward. So to see that we are educating young people about this Ujama philosophy within a digital space, you know, is giving us an opportunity to know that, you know, we are advancing forward with the progress of technology, but also designing things that authentically empower the community, both urban and rural, putting them in the spaces where they could trade and build a beautiful economic system for each other. Welcome back to Unpacked here on Cafero.tv. Uh, we've been having a discussion on cybersecurity, and uh, uh, today, sorry, I beg your pardon, we're going to ask our audience for some questions that they might have in regards to what we've been uh, discussing. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, yes, um, as a, a cybersecurity expert, what do you think about uh, AI? Now it's really advancing, is it a bit? threat to security or is it going to really, uh, I don't know, so, solve many problems mm. uh, in security? Like for example, maybe someone can sit down and then uh, build a virus powered by AI. So what do you think about that? Okay, well, <laughs> so the question is basically if uh, artificial intelligence is a threat uh, uh, when it comes to cyber security, um, if I got you right. So, artificial intelligence is uh, something big. It's, it's very big right now. And if we look at the organization that really work with that, DAPA, which are the American Defense, basically, uh, they do also a lot of showing what is already today possible. And you find that they actually use artificial intelligence I don't know if everyone knows artificial intelligence, but basically I give a computer algorithm to learn and according to what it learns, it can make own decisions more or less. So I don't need to tell go left, go right. It looks and sees a picture and knows, okay, that's a human. I need to pass and passes it more or less. So with artificial intelligence today, you can actually combat uh, certain attacks because I will learn that the animal is supposed to go with four legs, but I'm seeing an animal going with three legs. Something is not right here. There's an anomaly, basically. So artificial intelligence now is used. I just been two weeks ago at ITSA in Germany, one of the biggest cybersecurity conferences, and they were showing what they do with it. And it's to analyze the behavior, which is different from the usual one. And a human will be slow maybe in that. That's when it comes a lot of data set and it helps to actually detect certain things. We need to understand also that in cybersecurity, when I, for example, have a virus, what is that? It's like there's a, there's a, a crime happened outside there, 
and someone now uh, is captured on the photo or what, and they say, this guy here did this and this. If you see him with a cap and a jacket and what, he did this and this and that. And that's how antivirus also works. They basically have to have an attack first. Once they had it once, they say, okay, that bad, da da da, look, so and so and so forth. Now, artificial intelligence now goes a bit further. It doesn't need too much of that information how he looks like. But it looks like, okay, the way this and that and that happens, it is a bad way. So, on the one side, it's used actually already in quite big software to do good things, more or less. In the bad way, um, yes, also possible that one can use it where this when we talk about mutation when it comes to cyber whereby i develop something and it mutates it changes it looks it changes its action it changes so and so forth so if i bring that into play yes it definitely could create a huge damage but to my knowledge we don't see much yet uh, of such outside there is still a research field but Right now, as I'm talking, I can be wrong because right now someone could have released something in that area. So it's a threat and we need to study. For me, I'm looking at Uganda, I'm like, where are these guys? They don't talk about artificial intelligence at all. But it's a huge, huge, huge field and too important to, to leave it out. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Are there like awareness programs that you conduct or that you could refer in case somebody wanted to know more about this? Mm. Are there platforms, maybe workshops or seminars where people can go and get more information about cybersecurity? Mm, good question. It, it's true we are, and I call myself in because I learn every day. Uh, in IT, especially cybersecurity, you learn every day. And I usually tell people that cybersecurity is like even worse than a newspaper. No one today wants to read the newspaper from yesterday. So it has to be basically right. from here. So what we have we looked at, at that challenge, I always say we have to start at home. We can't always look, someone has to do trainings or what. So we started, some two years ago, we started cybersecurity conferences here in Uganda, where we actually really give awareness training um, at low price, because it's not to pay what we are valued at. A cybersecurity professional doesn't earn less than $800 a day, and that's still very little. Um, so when I do trainings in that area, it's not really paying me just to put that there. But we teach, we give that knowledge and go online. I mean, there are resources online, etc. We work with EC Council now, we're partners with them, which is the number global one in the world that does actually really the, the deep, deep, deep stuff, uh, deep training. So when you want to know more, come to our website, kpm-connect.com. We have the, an event coming up. We keep updating it because it moves so fast and we're going to share more on that side. Uganda, we have a, a Zaka, you, you have there, there and there and little, but we actually really just want to give awareness and on that we ought to do special trainings. Um, my name is Derek and my question is uh, with regards to, we've all seen these WhatsApp messages that have been passing around recently that uh, <laughs> our WhatsApps are being monitored by the government. I want to know how possible that is and whether our government has the resources to pull that off, considering we have 19 million mobile phone services in Uganda or something. Okay, yeah. wow. Yes, wow, what's up? Are we monitored? Uh, is someone looking at it now? If I say yes, I'm in jail tomorrow. If I say no, I'm in jail maybe of myself. Um, you see, we need to understand one thing. There's the software. We can crack and get information by cracking that software or we crack the device and get the information. So it's not always that now WhatsApp must be insecure that it is accessible. What about your phone? Is it accessible? Can I access your phone? And uh, sadly, in most cases, I don't need to hack WhatsApp. Your phone already is open for me like that. Right now, there's a huge vulnerability on almost, I don't want to say, but a huge number of devices. And uh, if we could pull out some techniques here, I would tell you this one, this one, this one would be 90% in this room. So uh, I don't need to hack the WhatsApp. 
your device is already open for me. The government of Uganda has a lot of stuff. I can't talk much about it. Uh, I believe you understand why. But uh, government of Germany, government of Switzerland, what they're all investing a lot of resources to be able to enter those crypto messaging application. But again, as I said, it's not that they have a key always to the, to the apps themselves or the application, the phone already. Before, because the message is on your phone, you're typing it. It's not yet encrypted. You press send, now it goes into the system, it's encrypted. But on the other device, again, it is decrypted and again open. So I don't need to enter the channel. I can just be on your side and be on the other side and have the information. The resource, do they have the resources? Yes, it's available. Why? I don't need to monitor every single phone. You know, we always think like, yeah, there are 30 million phones and WhatsApp and what, but not all of them are interesting for me. I might be just interested in a certain set. And so I just say, okay, whoever writes bomb, attack, and so on and so forth. Uh, I monitor everyone else. Hey, baby, sweetheart, how are you? The baby's in bed and what? I don't need that. Kiss, kiss, hugs, what? We leave that there. Uh, but there was an interesting story some time ago where um, the hackers actually used Twitter as a, uh, as a command machine to do a really, really good hack. And what they did is they hack like Britney Spears' account and other big accounts where they really have volume. And then they will use the words, normal words we communicate, but they will encode something in between them. So for you, we say, hey, baby, I love you. Hey, Britney Spears, this photo was really amazing. But within the wording will be actually commands. Attack, Angela, uh, do this, like that. So what I'm saying with words, don't take it too lightly. Uh, sweetheart, honey, how are you? Could be dangerous, actually. <laughs> was we've been talking about hackers, and I hope we can do this briefly, but um, is there a good hacker and a bad hacker? Should we assume that all hackers are, are out to get us mm. the worst? I'm a good hacker. <laughs> no. Um, first of all, hacker itself is a very good thing. I'm not saying it because I work in the area, but hacker himself is a very good thing. The crackers are the bad guys. But Microsoft turned it badly at one point. They said their hackers are the bad guys. No, there are a lot of good hackers, actually. Actually, a hacker's job is to show that this thing is not okay. Someone put a drop into the clean water and something is not right. And they basically show there is something which we have to fix. And if it's not fixed, there's a damage that's going to occur. There's one time a guy who came up and said, you know what, I found a hack to... Uh, what do you call this thing, keeping your heart working when you... Uh, pacer? Uh-huh, a pacer, heart mm -hmm. pacer. And he said, there's a hack and I know how to put it off. And everyone got alarmed because now this is not any more jokes. I mean, someone passes you and you poof, someone goes elsewhere. And I'm, talking, I'm not talking of a movie, huh? reality. So, but if he'd not talk about it, the industry will have, if they knew or they didn't know, but they will have hid it. They will have not done anything. Like the web corporates like Microsoft, Google, Facebook, what would, would that actually keep releasing information? Say, there's this, there's that. Now, if you want to be a hacker and make some good money, there are websites where they say, look, hack me and I give you $500,000. Uh, why not? So there are different types of hackers. Black hat, white hat. The blacks usually do it for bad stuff. The white hack basically do it for good things. So there are corporates which can call me and say, please come, hack me. Please. And they don't call me because I'm a bad guy, but they call me because I'm actually a good guy. So you sign your paper, you don't just do it, huh? <laughs> you sign a paper, you agree with the CEO, yes, you're allowed to hack me, and you're gonna tell me how you hacked me so that I can secure myself. So there's not just bad and good, um, there's usually the motivation, what motivation's behind it. So there's a government hacking in ev almost every country. I don't know, good or bad. There's private hacking, etc. but we have to look at why are they hacking. So there's not just bad and just good. There are different types of them. You pointed out something interesting about um, getting money, hack me. 
I believe they're called uh, bug bounty or something. Bug bounty, yes. Bounty. Um, we always get questions like, how do we find jobs online? So I think that would be a good area. But I even in terms of skills, mm. do you think Uganda itself is uh, prepared in terms of security? Do we have enough resource in the security, cyber security field? Uh, when we talk about our information being taken, uh, big data mm -hmm. being monetized. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we are continuously feeding mm. the system on our Facebook accounts mm -hmm. and our Twitter. Mm -hmm. and do you think as many people are on their mobile phones and all those social media platforms, do we have the human resource to kind of keep us, keep us secure? No. It's the same thing like if we ask if we have enough human resource to keep all cities of Kampala safe. I believe they're all safe, but um, no. Cyber, first of all, it is cyber security is really one of the high, high, high level domain. And I need to know about Oracle databases. I need to know about MS Square, Linux, Windows. I mean, I need to know so much. So even if I need to hack, there's stuff I can't hack. Not because I don't want to, but because I just don't have the knowledge like that. So um, resources worldwide, they're not there. Germany now was recruiting a lot of cyber security professionals and they don't have enough. You go to London, they don't have enough. You go to America, they don't, now Uganda. Where are they trained? And if one guy did like one of our certificates, we not certificate, but our trainings, and really became an ethical hacker, for example, that guy immediately will be off market. I mean, it's, I, I understand there may be free ethical hackers in Uganda, maybe like that. So once you're in that field, um, you are rare material, very rare. And if I'm in Switzerland, where I work now these days, I'm a real material. It's a cyber, and they're better guys than me for sure. Like that in Germany, the same thing. So um, because, as I mentioned, cyber. I mean, it's a hacker or cyber security expert. What it means, you have a very high level of understanding. That means if you're that level, then you can also work on this level and on this level. And those are very rare people on the market. Wow. Um, let's talk about Internet of Things. <laughs> Yes. Uh, we, we still probably can't believe that at one point our fridges will be on the internet, cars will be on the internet. How do we prepare our minds for this? Because if we're saying we can't actually even secure our phones, I think what are some of the things that we might be facing futuristically mm. in, types of, in, in terms of security? Wow, yes. Um, I mean... We're here in Uganda and uh, myself, I travel a lot and I see what's over there. So when I look at Uganda, I'm like, okay, infant stage, infant stage and, and what? But, you know, in Uganda, we have one very unique thing. It is one of the youngest population in the world. And, I mean, I don't want to be one day 80, but I think my brain will really slow down totally. But when I, my age and even others younger than me, they have a cap capability a way to grasp information and do a running speed, which is amazing. So I think we should not fear the animal, but we should try to understand what is it. Uh, Internet of Things is an amazing technology itself, what you can do with it. And I just been at one of the universities and they just showed me what they do inside there. And I was like, wow, this is, I mean, they do robotic and what, what. I was amazed at what they do. but for them even getting the group being interested for it is a challenge. So I think, uh, yes, we need to prepare for it. As I mean, outside there, you find that people now know how to open your car from afar because they know how to hack into your system because they all communicate now together. I recently drove with a friend, actually told me like, come drive, we drive around with my new, I think it was the BMW or a Mercedes. And uh, we were still in the office. The parking was still, I don't know, two kilometers to walk. And uh, then it's when the way he looked on his phone and said, oh, my uh, windshield, the, the, the upper one is open and I see rain is coming. So I need to press and it closes like that. And they just press on the phone and 
the, the thing closes and actually it prays and says something's not working properly and later just it closes it all virtually basically there and that happens as you said now in their homes you press the button light goes off you enter their house things happen automatically and all that for here in uganda i would say we just need to be opening up our mind to it and say you know what we didn't put cable into the ground before we get to the mobile but we jumped a whole technology step and that has helped uganda in in a very special way so we need people to look at internet of things and other things and just grab it and grab an expert who are out there i mean i see experts coming in here but no one grabs them and say like oh, please please so i brought some gadgets with me actually some of the very special chips that are used in mo mo most of those things because we have an NGO and we want to bring to the youth the technology and then to train people like, okay, this is it. And so, so we just have to grab it. Don't be afraid of it. I mean, I learned technology by just breaking it. And my mom used to tell me, Michael, you know, just brand new TV, what are you doing there? But I had to go with this screwdriver because I want to understand that guy, how do you enter the TV? How, how is he talking to me? And this guy never sleeps. Whenever I put on the TV, he's there. <laughs> like that. So you have to take the screwdriver mm. and just try it out. Just see what is really behind. Mm. By that you learn, then you say, okay, it's not the monster actually. Let me use it. And then you do something very special. You now implement it for something that works in Uganda. Right. Not just copy what is out there, mm. but put it basically here into place. So I always say, please, don't, don't be afraid of it. Mm. We all started somehow. Bill Gates is starting in the garage. Mm. Google, they start in a garage with few. Facebook, the, the one the, you could have, you will have sat beside them, say, hey, buddy, how are you today? Beer, that's it. Today, sit beside one of them. You're like, hey, please, can I polish your shoes or something? Totally different story like that. So we should embrace it. What cyber concern do you have as the real pressing one? Like, what would be your worst nightmare? Wow. <laughs> nightmare. Someone entering my phone where I just wrote honey. No. <laughs> I think, as I mentioned, we have certificated now uh, software and what. And there, you, you find today, like right now, what's happening is that we have those chips in the iPad, in the iPhone, in different phones. And they found that in the chip, there's an error. But those chips, they go out in millions and millions and millions. Mm -hmm. That means. If someone misuses it, like we had the heart bleed and other attacks in the past, or the windows, what happened with WannaCry and what, uh, if someone misuses one vulnerability in it and uses on the mass scale that we have not seen yet, then we're going to see something what we just have not seen yet, basically. And that would be like my nightmare that someone will just not know some, no one will know how to plug out the plug they take out the out, out the cable out of the plug so that's why we need so much education and and and, and really take it from the from the ground let's say you know what, let's let's tackle it and my nightmare basically goes in the direction where the government doesn't know the private might know but the government doesn't know but the government is the one that can do big scale i can just do a small scale but government can go farther so i really uh, think that that would be the worst if we have a vulnerability there and we have them already it's not something new but someone really uses it at the scale we have not seen yet and the more we get connected you know we don't think about it, but we all get more internet what what now have earphones you don't even have cables what now there's a new earphone you put in it has uh amazon alexa which is the technology where you can talk and order and everything is you just have it in your ear and you, you don't have any more cables on it what it's just there and it has internet everything apple now has the watch that has the sim card inside gps inside everything is in there so we're we're wearing more technology, which is so powerful that if that technology was misused in some way and actually it has rolled out to a bigger base and then misused, the damage would be catastrophic. Yeah. Okay, so basically we've had a full discussion about cybersecurity. I don't know if I'll leave my camera on my phone without <laughs> sticky tape. But um, what's your final statement? What's your, what's your encouraging word, especially you mentioning um, our population, 80% under mm. the age of 30. What's your encouragement to them? 
in order to well curb this uh, mm. situation that we're going to internet of things how mm. how can they be part of rescuing us maybe from, mm. from mm. Uh, the cyber attacks that we might be facing in the future yeah i i i really say um we have to put some things aside and start really get serious because whenever I talk, wherever I am, people ask me, oh, can you offer me a job? They hear of the company in Uganda, Zambia, Rwanda, Germany, wherever. Like, okay, can you offer me a job? But people are not interested just to give you a job. They want that they get your talent. You come to them as a talent. You don't say, give me a job, but you tell them, let me come and do something with my talent. In your place, that's going to change certain things. So with the youth level here in Uganda, and again, the poverty and the job market, what? The youth with the access we have today in the cyber, YouTube, you can today see how to repair a car. You can even learn on YouTube how to go artificial, artificial uh, intelligence. You, we have Coursera, which costs less money, or Udemy. I mean, there's so many platforms. You can spend a little amount of money, but get an access of information, very valuable, which is immersed. So, I really recommend and say, and my hope is that the youth embraces the tools and the access that we have today, not to seek for a job, but actually be a job creator for yourself first and then for others and then inspire others because Apple, the Apple phone, for example, or you hear now about Tesla, Kaikada drives completely automatically. And so you hear about technology like, wow. But you see someone sat down and looked at an issue and he found it worth enough for him that it was big enough to invest his time, his energy to find a solution to it. Today we're looking at, wow, nice phone, but someone sat down at one point for it. And that can be you, that can be you, that can be you. So don't think too little of yourself. You are way more than that. And you could be the next Steve job. I mean, we look at Steve Jobs, he's dead. Now you come up and do something special. Bill Gates is totally aged. Not that I don't respect him, but he's aged. Mm -hmm. But you're still young. You have the potential. So use the energy you have. Use the access that you have. Use the little maybe you think is little, but turn it into something big. Because the big tree you see outside there was one time just a small seed. But that seed decided also to die at one point. <laughs> so you sacrifice. You sacrifice, I don't go to the party, I sit down. I sit basically minimum seven, eight hours a day on a computer. Minimum. And when I go to management talks, I tell them this is what has to be done. And often I thank God I'm right. But because I invested my time. So invest. And if you want to live different in the future, you have to live different today. Most, most people don't want to do that sacrifice. They want to live today different and have everything, but I've never done an investment for it. So do your investment and don't think what you have is little. What you have is really way more than that because some don't hear, some don't have hands, What you have everything basically. So that would be my really point to say, just embrace it. There's smart people around, embrace it, do, and you change the history basically. Wow, that was Michael Shiburuna Genda, our security cyber security expert. Michael, thank you so much. Thank you too for hosting us. And we hope we will, this is not being the last that we'll see you. We wish you all the best. Thank you very much. And that was Untacked on Cafero.tv. Thank you for joining us. Okay.